Hey everyone, it's Conrad Bobby Luck here, CEO of Investors Prime Real Estate and best-selling international author of Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. A welcome to today's video. I can't emphasize the importance of getting a building inspection done on the property, even if it's brand new. All my clients, and I insist on this, have a building inspection done. In fact, you have to have it done if you want to protect yourself as an investor, number one. Number two, you want to make sure there's any defects in the property that get addressed before the tenants move in. So that's very important. That's what today's video is all about. <laughs> now, a bit of a personal disclaimer, uh, I'm not here to give you any financial advice. So anything that you do, please seek independent financial advice. And I'm not here to teach you anything or pretend or give you any kind of advice or imply in any way, shape or form that anything you do as a result, these videos will make you any money at all. The only guarantee I want to give you guys, if you do nothing, you're going to end up dead broke at 65 on, on the pension, which is not a good place to be. Now, my background, a uh, bit about myself. I wasted four years at Monash University doing a business degree. Then I got into financial planning with Australian Unity Funds Management. Left there, got into mortgage broking. Eventually worked in private banking and med fin for NAB. And now I run a real estate company for the last 10 years, which is my passion and my healthy obsession, <coughs> which is Investors Prime Real Estate. The most important thing, guys, is that I'm an investor myself with a multi-million dollar property portfolio in Melbourne, and I'm doing all the things that you guys are doing. I'm, I'm buying properties, revaluating properties, renovating properties, talking to valuers, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, financiers, eight, you know, depreciation specialists, quality surveyors, lawyers, accountants, list goes on. Uh, if you want to get a copy of my book, if you want to smash your mortgage in record time and uh, we, we teach a mortgage reduction program, jump onto bookonfinance.com.au or any good bookshop including Amazon and realestatemadesimple.com.au <coughs> or Amazon or Booktopia or any good bookshop. Now, what I want to do today is also, and I want to thank you guys for supporting my book because it's been, been number one multiple times now on Amazon in various categories. In fact, many times it's been number one and two for both books in the same category, which is fantastic. Back in 2022, we put together an amazing team of experts in Melbourne and we ran a four day boot camp, which is called the Property Portfolio Accelerator Summer 2022. And this is really the whole team that you need if you want to build your wealth through property investing. There's kind of four things that you need to succeed as a property investor. Number one, you need psychology and mindset, which, which is what I teach in my YouTube channel. And then psychology and mindset is very complex and it's, it takes a long time to cultivate and there's different phases of your mindset going through and transitioning as your paradigm shifts from what you've been conditioned to believe at school into understanding the language of money, which is not what school system teaches you. You know, it's ironic I did a business commerce degree and not once has anyone taught me how to make any money or reduce my mortgage or teach me about trading shares or lines of credit. <laughs> it's crazy. What a waste of time. Anyway, so you need psychology and mindset. Number two, you need a plan. You need an all-inclusive all plan of exactly what's relevant to you given your set of circumstances. What I mean by that is your risk profile, where you are in life, your tax that you're paying, and your objectives. Do you want capital growth? Do you want rental yield? Why are you buying properties in the first place? <clears throat> then you need a whole team of experts to implement that plan, which is these guys here. So I do the property sourcing, Cameron does the leasing, Stephen McClutchy does lending from Loans Australia. He's been ranked in the top 10 out of 3,500 brokers in Australia. James Black does all the structuring. He's an accountant that specializes in properties. So he looks after trusts, self money super funds. Joel is director of United um, Global Capital. He's a financial planner that loves property. And he does a lot of property transactions in and out of self money super funds. Emma is a lawyer. She teaches wills and estate planning and testamentary trust. Colin Adno from Bad and Sex Lawyers. He does all the contracts around property. So you can engage your services to check your contract to sale. <clears throat> Pasha, he can fix up your credit file. And Brendan Frost, who's director of Landmark Inspections, is one of the best building inspectors that I've ever dealt with. In fact, most of my clients uh, are looked after by him because he does such a good job. Not only does building inspections on the actual structure, he does plumbing and electrical inspections. And I'll talk to you about more about that as well as we go through. So you need the team and then you need to have your property due diligence and research down pat. So you need psychology, 
the team, the plan, the team to implement the plan, and the cho- you need to choose the right properties. If you put all those things together, the definition of success eventuates. If you stuff up your team, you'll never succeed in property investing. So if you've got the conservative accountant, you know, that has a little office somewhere between a milk bar and a laundromat, you, you can't help you to make money. You've got to have the right team and you've got to play with the right people to make sure you get the results. <laughs> Building inspections are a must, especially for established properties. You're buying a property that's secondhand or established as they call them, you have to get a building inspection done as a, as a subject to satisfactory building inspection as part of your contract of sale. So you get a good lawyer who can put that clause into your contract of sale. I would never personally buy any property without doing a full comprehensive building inspection, including electrical and plumbing. I want to make sure the property is 100% without any problems. And if there are problems, you can also use this as a leverage tool to get a better deal from the from the vendor or the developer or better terms of settlement. So either way, you can't lose. For the amount of money that you're paying, which is between, I don't know, $500 to $1,000, depending on what, what the building inspection is, I mean, we're talking about nothing compared to spending a million dollars on the property. So the, so the biggest mistakes that I've seen over the years is when people don't get a building inspection, they settle the property, tenants move in, and eventually they get water damage, they get leaky pipes, they get structural movements in the property, and then it's usually not a question of $1,000 or less, it's usually tens of thousands of dollars and regret. And, you know, it could really set people back to the point where they never move forward with building their property portfolio because it can deter them from building their wealth. So having that building inspection company independently working for you as an investor is a must. So we're going to listen in to Brendan's con- uh, presentation that he did for us in 2022 um, which he'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of having a building inspection, but also what it entails exactly, what kind of building inspections are available. And he'll go through some case studies and some horror stories to show you some of the workmanship quality that exists in Australia. Because now, especially in Melbourne, we have a critical shortage of tradies. A lot of the tradies have gone to Queensland, and I'm seeing a lot of substandard workmanship in, in properties at completion, not from our company, but independently out there, because I'm looking at properties all day long to buy as an investor myself. So you've got to make sure you'll be dealing with a reputable company, which is definitely landmarks, 5,000 inspections completed for, um, you know, <clears throat> over the years, 200 plus five-star reviews, 30 years combined experience, 100% satisfaction guarantee. So this is one of the best building inspection companies out there. And uh, let's listen in to Brendan right now, and I'll see you at the end of the video. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Brendan. I'm the founder of Landmark Inspections. Um, what do we do? Uh, I'll go into that in a, in, a, in a moment. A little bit about me. I'd like to introduce myself properly first. So my background is I'm a builder by trade. Did an apprenticeship 20 odd years ago, went on, created a uh, construction and property development business, ran that for around about 10 or 11 years before I got uh, an opportunity to go into building inspections. I uh, started work uh, doing inspections for a uh, national inspection company. I somehow or another, before too long, became their national operations manager. I was there for about three years uh, before I founded Landmark Inspections. So what is Landmark Inspections? Landmark Inspections is an independent, uh, independent inspection company. We don't work with any builders. We work for property owners, uh, investors, home, uh, owner-occupiers, providing independent and completely unbiased reports. So there's no, uh, there's no interference with builders. The builder can try to get away with blue murder we're not going to allow it. We're here to protect your interest. So we started operations in Victoria, uh, soon expanded into New South Wales and then South East Queensland. And then last year we, we uh, expanded the service offering uh, in line with the, uh, the rental safety requirements in Victoria for the gas, electricity and uh, smoke alarm assessments. So over the last three to six months in particular, Everyone's heard a lot of uh, a lot of media uh, interest in, uh, in in how builders are failing. They're producing pretty pretty poor workmanship. They, there seems to be another builder going into insolvency on a daily basis. 
So I wanted to discuss what systems are in place to protect the, the, the home builder. So if you're building a property, you might have a uh, contract uh, to, to buy an investment property. Uh, what is there to protect you? So the, 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 first, uh, the first thing is builder's warranty insurance. So builder's warranty insurance is uh, it's a mandatory insurance that is required uh, before any building permit is issued for works to commence. It's, it's provided by the builder. However, the builder must list the property owner as, as the insured party. Okay? Uh, the amount covered must be the same as the contract amount. So if you've got a, a house and land package, uh, a townhouse that uh, is being built uh, for, say, 1.1 mil, it's not for the 1.1 mil, it's for the build contract only. So it's for $600,000 for the build. It doesn't include the land aspect. When does this insurance come into play? We often get asked this. There's a lot of, uh, it's not very clear. The insurance only is activated when the builder goes missing, dies, or becomes bankrupt. So you might think it's a pointless insurance, and in a lot of instances it is, because it doesn't protect you from dodgy workmanship. It only protects you if the builder isn't rectifying the workmanship because he's dead, missing, or bankrupt. So where I'm going with this is it takes a long time for this policy to ever be utilised. So what happens if, uh, so as I said, we're all hearing about builders going bankrupt every second day. What happens if your builder goes bankrupt? You lodge a claim with your insurer. The problem is it's not acted upon until the, the bankruptcy is finalised. So the, the process to bankruptcy, you call in the administrators, you're an insolvent business, they try to salvage the business, it takes six, 12 months sometimes. That whole time, you've got the holding costs of the property. You're sitting there twiddling your thumbs going, what's happening with my home? Well, not much. So what most people will try to do is they will try to seek another builder to take over the contract of the original builder. There's two issues with this. Number one, the, the builder number two doesn't want to take the risk of the workmanship by builder number one, obviously. The other issue is if a business has gone into insolvency and approaching bankruptcy, there's a good chance they had pretty, pretty, pretty razor-thin margins. The second builder doesn't want to accept razor-thin margins for taking on, on the job. It doesn't make financial sense to them. So what often will occur is the property owner will end up tens of thousands out of pocket to pay the second builder to take on the project to increase his margin to an attractive position just to get the project finished because you can't afford the, the, the holding costs for six, 12, 18 months just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. The next role that I'm going to discuss is the role of the relevant building surveyor. So a lot of people think the relevant building surveyor uh, is constantly out on site doing the, the, the checks of the, of the construction, making sure the house is being built to a good standard. Unfortunately, that's not completely correct. The building surveyor is, it's, it's actually a desk, desk job. Um, the building surveyor very, very rarely will go out onto site. The building surveyor issues the building permits. They uh, issue occupancy permits. They can issue directions to the builder. Uh, they can issue stop work notices. However, it's not a, an on-site gig at all. They rely on uh, the building uh, inspector that they have appointed uh, that they have appointed to report back to them any building defects. Now, the problem with that is they only do four inspections throughout the course of construction. So they'll inspect the the, the footings of the of, of the of the slab. Uh, then they'll inspect the steel within the slab the frame, and then a final inspection. Nothing else gets, gets assessed. The other thing that a lot of people don't realise is it's not an in-depth ex examination of the quality of workmanship at the property. It's very, very uh, blasé, if you like, uh, where it checks the, the, checks the drawings. There's a, meant to be a beam above a window. There's a beam above a window. Check, and it moves on. 
doesn't necessarily check the sizing of the beam. It certainly doesn't check the fixings of the beam or any of them important details. It's just a checkbox inspection. That's all it is. That building inspector reports back to the building surveyor at the end of the project, providing each stage is inspected and, and, and approved. The building surveyor, once he's got all these other documentation in place, will issue an occupancy permit. What other documentation does he need? He needs certification that all of the relevant trades throughout the course of the build have built it to a good standard. How do you do that? Self-certification. Well, that's a, that's a flawed system right there. So you've got a waterproofer that applies his own waterproofing material. He then writes his own certificate saying, I've applied this to the Australian standards and it's taken as gospel truth. It doesn't work. A lot of these independent trades businesses are small sole traders or mum and dad businesses. They don't have continuous ongoing professional development. They don't have ongoing uh, uh, other means of educating themselves and training themselves in current and best practices. A lot of them aren't updated with the Australian standards of today. They're basing it on Australian standards of 20 years ago when they started in the trade. And sure, they might do a relatively good job, but they're not doing best practices. There's a reason uh, best practices and Australian standards are updated, because our knowledge is always increasing. And it's real, so it's really important that these trades get this, this, uh, this system right to get to, the, to, to, to where they should be uh, constructing. We'll move on. Um, what happens when there is a dispute? So you've moved into your property, you've got some, some, some cracking appearing, you want to know who's responsible for this, how do I get it rectified? There's a couple of options here. Number one, and what I would always recommend, go straight to the builder, get the builder to assess it and provide you their, their opinion. If the builder's not conducive to rectifying it, most builders will be. Uh, my experience tells me, maybe I'm a little bit naive and try to have the, try to think the best of humanity. If that fails, I recommend getting uh, an independent building assessment done. Someone like us, we can come out, we can provide you independent report, uh, an independent report, an independent, completely unbiased opinion on if this is reasonable or if it's not. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so, so sorry. I, uh, a defect, yeah, really good question. So anywhere between uh, 90 days, so there's, there's a few cut cutoffs. So 90 days, two years, seven years or 10 years. It depends on the nature of the claim. Uh, um, Brendan, we're going to just um, keep questions to the end because you may sure. be covering some of the stuff that... Uh, no, no, no worries at all, Stephen. So if, if we come in uh, or a consultant such as us comes in and says, no, the builder should be liable for this and they should be rectifying it, you, you go back to the builder and the builder's still refusing to rectify, where do you go from there? The first step is to uh, lodge a complaint or, or an application for the D, DBDRV, so D, the Domestic Builders Dispute Resolution of Victoria. They're a mediating authority. Uh, they don't issue any directions. They simply, uh, they will sit down with you and the builder effectively uh, and try to mediate a, uh, an outcome. Um, it's a relatively straightforward application process. It's online. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you lodge your complaint there. They act really quickly, so which is surprising for a government organisation, but they, they get onto things within a couple of weeks. Uh, usually within, I think they aim for a three-month complete resolution period, uh, but often it's, it's much less than that. Um, if no outcome is, is, is achieved, because they are just a mediator and you've got to agree with the builder, the next process is VCAT. VCAT is something to try to avoid for as long as possible. It's not something anybody wants to be at. VCAT is the uh, Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. They can issue and will issue a, a direction to either party to resolve a dispute. Um, before you go down this path, a lot of people say, why, why do I have to go through the DBDRV? 
if I can, if I know the build is not going to be reasonable and we're not going to be able to negotiate a settlement. Because VCAT makes you. You can't lodge a dispute, a building dispute with VCAT unless you have an eligibility number from DBDRV saying you've gone through that process. Once you're in the VCAT system, VCAT will encourage you to continue negotiations with the builder if, if, if able to. Because they don't want to, they're, they're, they're trying to reduce their, 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 uh, their time frames that are currently quoted as sitting between 37 and 53 weeks. I can tell you from experience, it's a lot closer to 53 than, 70, than 37. It's by far a lot, a lot closer to 53. Once, they'll go through the same, similar processes of the DBDRV. They'll sit down with, e with each party. They'll try to mediate an outcome. If that doesn't occur uh, and it can't be resolved that way, it will go to a directions hearing. At that directions hearing, the tribunal member will make a, a decision. They'll, they'll, they'll tell the builder, you've got to rectify this, or you, Mr Property Owner or Mrs Property Owner, you've got to move on with your life and, and look past this crack in the wall. Either way, they'll make a decision and that's final. If after that stage, one of the parties that needs to do something, or both, isn't conducive to doing them, you can apply to a court uh, to, uh, to enforce action upon the other party. Again, something that needs to be avoided, if at all possible. So I'm going, going to go through a bit of a case study with you. A couple of years ago, we uh, were engaged by a property owner. Uh, this property owner had, uh, had started construction with a builder of seven apartments in, uh, in Baldwin, actually. Nice area. It was an 18-month contract. After just over two years, the builder got fed up with how long the contract or how long the building works were taking. The, the property was about 50% complete. He had no concerns about the quality, it was just the timeliness and the lack, the lack of progress on site. So he is, uh, he's got rid of that builder number one, brought builder number two in, builder number two has agreed to take the project on, but they wanted a condition report on exactly the state of the property before builder number two took over. So we came in. This is how we found it. It was a three-storey complex, basement underground, uh, Besser block wall construction, suspended slabs, typical apartment construction mythology. As soon as we walked in, we've, we've been told by the property owner and the builder, there's no defects here, this is a formality process only. We're allowed to be there for one day. We spent three and a half days at the property. The first day, or well, the first moment we've walked in, we've walked into the basement, you can see the honey, honeycombing of the, uh, of the slab here. This is, this is a suspended slab. This happens when the, when the concrete, during the concrete pour, isn't vibrated and compacted enough. What happens is, you can't see it in the photo here, but this is still reinforcement through all these, the, the, these areas. That could be visible, it was visible. It was rusting. What happens when it's rusting? It's called concrete cancer, we call it in, in the industry. And what happens is that steel expands as it rusts and it actually blows the concrete out. Okay? So what will happen is over time this section will blow out and this section over here will blow out and it will gradually get worse and worse and worse. That rust will keep going and per permeating further and further back the in the steel and it will keep blowing out the concrete until structural, structural fa failure occurs. We've gone upstairs to the first floor. As we're walking through doing our assessment, you can see, I'll show you here, an orange line. See that? Some stepped cracking was evident. We saw that and we thought, that's a little bit strange. This wall's a core field wall. Why is this, uh, this, this cracking? We don't expect to see this at all. We're assessing it from back here, looking at it. We're on the other side, looking at it. And lo and behold, we could see daylight penetrating straight through the wall. It was only a hairline crack. It was less than a millimetre. But you could see it from the right angle, you could see daylight. We went, oh, shit, this isn't good. So we started tapping the wall. Sounds hollow. No, that can't be right. So we got a hammer out and we're tapping the wall. Still sounds hollow. Okay. So we got a, uh, an X-ray scanner out, very specialised equipment. 
We started scanning the walls. And there were literally walls, that whole wall did not have a skerrick of concrete in it. No concrete at all. This is supporting a couple of hundred tonnes in a, in a slab above. And it's on better blocks that are that thick. It was mind-blowing. It really was. All of these yellow dots, they represent hollow bricks. Okay? So what's happened here? Well, number one, they just didn't want to fill this wall up with concrete. Maybe they were a truck short. I don't know what's happened there. But with these areas here, what's happened? They've obviously used a mix that wasn't suitable for core filling. They haven't vibrated it enough. And that, that, something has failed. But whatever's happened isn't bloody good enough. This will lead to structural failure. The whole thing could bloody collapse. So we'll continue on. Outside, like I said, we've got a basement. Around the basement of the perimeter, we've got uh, retaining walls that are supporting ground about three metres high. We can see in photo on the left here, this is all clay. It's been backfilled against the retaining wall with clay. Now clay, when it gets wet, is extremely heavy. It doesn't let the water run through it. Water will form and fill up behind the wall here, causing hydrostatic pressure, and the wall will blow out. Okay, So this was right around the whole perimeter. So we're talking about 140 lineal metres uh, of, uh, of, of excavation that's going to have to occur. This is what it should look like. So it should have scoria or other suitable drainage material that moisture can freely flow through, get to the base of the wall to the ag agricultural drain, and discharge away. We've jumped on the roof. Roof looks pretty good. I think we can all agree. Looks, looks pretty good. They're looking at it going, there's fixings. OK. I wonder how steep the roof is. So we've got the architectural drawings out. The architectural drawings said it was a one degree pitch. Hmm. OK. Well, perhaps the original builder, this roofing material is a lot cheaper than clip lock roofing. Perhaps the original builder has up the pitch of the roof with the trusses, with the timber trusses, uh, to, to save on the roofing material. We tried to uh, obtain the uh, trust, trust documentation. The trust documentation wasn't available to us, unfortunately, so we had to measure it on site. Did some calculations, 1.2 degrees this roof was laid at. That material needs to be at an absolute minimum of three degrees. Reason being, moisture will sit behind these screws and rust each screw out. And then there's roof leaks. And you don't want that in an apartment building. So this whole roof had to be replaced. We produced this report. Like I said, we anticipated to spend a day there. We spent three and a half. Uh, we produced a report. The builder and the property owner were absolutely gobsmacked. The owner actually had some tears. No one expected anything like this at all. They asked us, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? Our biggest concern was the block walls that weren't core filled. That was, a, that was by far the biggest thing. So we said, go to the design engineer. They went to the design engineer, keeping in mind they've spent about $1.4 million to get the property to this stage. The design engineer said, pull the building down. It's got to be restarted. This is not structurally sound. There's no way to remedy this without demolishing. But our client has come back to us and said, do you think this is fair income? After consideration uh, for a little while, I thought that seems very conservative of that design engineer. Engineers are notoriously conservative people. Um, they've got a lot on the line, but we didn't think that was right. So we did some consulting work with, uh, with, with the guys there um, and we ended up uh, uh, getting onto a forensic engineer that specialises in remediation works. He has actually worked on another project that this builder has started and the same thing has occurred about three years earlier, which is great for us. It's not so good for the consumer because this, this, this apartment builder has built a lot in, these, in, this, in, in this sort of area. And if it's happened on two, it's going to happen on more that no one's aware of. We were able to, with the assistance of the forensic engineer, design a uh, suitable rectification process. 
It was slow. It was tedious. It took over six months to core fill these walls. It was literally drill 40 millimeter holes in each block and pump it full of concrete. It was ridiculously tedious work. We stayed on. So through this process, everyone could see from a mile away this was going to end up going through VCAT and the court, the court system. So we stayed on. We documented the entire rectification process. Once we got to the conclusion of that, the developer had spent another $250,000 on rectification work that, the, that he had not budgeted for. He'd also lost sales of three of the apartments because it had been so long. Uh, they were expecting to hand over 12 months before this stage. We still weren't finished. So they walked away. You can't blame them for that. The property owner said to us, once these rectifications were done, can you guys stay on and keep a close eye of this builder? We're more than happy to do that. That's our core business. So we stayed on. We provided further ongoing assistance. The builder number two did an absolutely superb job. Uh, yeah, could, he couldn't have done any better. That just gives you a little bit of an example of the, some of the poor workmanship out there. That relevant building surveyor and his appointed, appointed inspector, he'd certified all that work. That work was all inspected at different stages. He said it was fine. So a little bit about Landmark. What do we do? Our main business activities are, uh, are inspections of properties under construction. So over the last, I've been doing these for six, seven years now, we've been refining our offering to, uh, to assist clients. I like to say we're trying to provide clients with peace of mind. There's other inspectors out there, they like to fearmonger and justify their existence. We're not like that. We try to give you peace of mind that what is being constructed is being constructed to a good standard. And the majority, in all honesty, the majority of items that we do list as defective, they're very minor in nature. So we offer these, these core services. I won't go through them individually. Um, I know Conrad's got some information in the workbook um, that, that I think details this, this a little bit further. Um, and if, you've, if you have got some questions, we're going to do a Q&A after this as well. We also do uh, the rental compliance safety checks. So 2021, there was major reform uh, in, in Victoria. All properties now, now must meet minimum rental standards. So things like, is the property structurally sound? Is there mould in the property? Are there locks on the door? Are there vermin-proof bins? Some of this is silly stuff. Why do these laws have to come in? Because there's about 2% of renters, uh, property investors out there that refuse to do any upkeep on their, on, their, on their investment properties. They're quite happy going and buying a 5 Series BMW like Conrad was talking of earlier, taking it to the mechanics every 6 or 12 months for its routine service. They've only done 4,000 kilometres in it, but it's due for a service. Let's take it in. We know it's depreciating in value, but we're going to maintain it anyway. They buy a $700,000 investment property. It's going up in value every year, but God forbid spending a, spending a couple of hundred dollars on some upkeep on, on the property. So they've had to in introduce these new laws. So we do the minimum safety checks. We also do the, the, the gas, electrical and smoke alarm checks as well. So gas and elect electrical fixtures in the property must be assessed every two years. Again, it's amazing. I've got, we've got guys at a property today. There's a gas leak at this property. The gas line was, only, was supposedly only re renewed 10 years ago. It's in, it's in copper, but there's a gas, gas leak there underneath the house. So we're literally cutting out a hole in the floor to find this gas leak. People have been living there. They've smelt gas on and off over the years, but didn't think anything of it because they knew the house was fully renovated before they moved in. And the smoke alarm assessment. If anyone's seen the news over the last month, there has been house fire after house fire after house fire, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland. I think some little kids were, were, were killed or seriously injured last week in New South Wales. Regardless if it's a, an investment property and you've got people living in it or if it's your property, get some working smoke alarms. Um, don't worry about engaging us. Put them up yourself. Go to Bunnings, get a $20 alarm and chuck it on the roof near the bedrooms. I cannot stress that highly enough. We do pre-purchase inspections. This is where the business started. 
So like every other inspector out there, we jump on the roof, we jump underneath the house, we jump in the roof, we go throughout the house. Most importantly, we don't have the emotional lens on. So we're looking at the property in its actual state. We're not thinking about where the school is or, 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 or how I'm going to furnish this room. We're looking at it objectively. We'll produce a really clear report. Our reporting system that we use, it's state of the art, it's, 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 it's a uh, cloud-based uh, system. Um, jump on our website and have a look at them. I'm sure most of you have seen building and pest inspection reports before. Check out ours and, uh, and, and let me know uh, what, what you think of the uh, report you've previously received. I have a special deal. So if you're purchasing a property off the plan, I would recommend engaging a consultant such as ourselves to do a practical completion inspection. Make sure the builder has prepared the house in a very good condition before handover has occurred. We will offer you a practical completion inspection, a pre-handover inspection. What we call a pre-handover inspection is simply a re-inspection. So we'll do the practical completion, uh, say today, in two weeks' time once we've given the builder an opportunity to go back and, uh, and make sure the property has been uh, now presented in the state that it should have been in the first place, we'll go back and, uh, and reassess that. We'll also do, give you a tax depreciation schedule. It's not from BMT, or I think it's BMT, it's from another organisation, uh, chartered quantity um, surveyors, which we do in-house uh, in conjunction with them. Total price, $1,100 inclusive of GST. Absolute bargain. Mm. That concludes what I was going to talk about. OK, put your hands together. Do you want to go back to the last slide? Yeah. Just leave it up. Absolutely. Uh, we're just going to do questions yeah, now. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? So hands up and um, young Jack will run around. First question over there, please. Uh, hi, Lee here. Um, do you guys work in conjunction with the surveyors also? So can you uh, provide the, the inspection report? No, we don't. So we don't work with any builders or surveyors directly. Uh, it's, 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 it's on purpose. Uh, we, we feel there may be the unintentioned, un, unintentional consequence of a customer thinking we have bias if we're working without any other professionals. So we only work for the consumer directly. Okay, next question. I think there was a question over here. Yep. Uh, just wait for the mic, please. Uh, yeah, just a normal time frame for um, processing a claim um, from DBDRV. Yeah, sure. So my understanding is, is they try to have uh, all issues resolved within three months. So once you've lodged a claim, they'll generally uh, begin actioning it within one to two weeks. They'll reach out to yourself and the other party. And then they really do try to stay on top of things after that. So I think they issue a two-week period for each party to receive, uh, to send in uh, any correspondence or, or evidence. Um, and then they try to get into a roundtable meeting. I think it's generally on Zoom at the moment um, to, to, to negotiate an outcome. Yeah. yeah. So if it's longer than three, four months, no, four months, and then because they don't receive calls, you know, uh, yeah. emails uh, is just one way, you know, so... Sure. So is, is this with the DBDRV or with the builder? DBDRV. Yeah, okay. with, yeah the builder pro issue, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that being the case, it'll get to a, a point where the DBDRV will handball this complaint if there's no action from one of the parties to VCAT and then VCAT will pursue it further. Yeah, but the DBDRV is not a, um, actioning at all? No. No, that, 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 they, uh, they're, uh, they're a dog without teeth, really. They have no bite at all. Um, yeah. They... Uh, they, uh, they proclaim to uh, make a big difference. They do very little, in, in all honesty. Um, the only time they're good is when there's two, there's two unreasonable parties. Um, so there'll be a party A over here, the, 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 we'll call them the homeowner. Uh, they are building a house in St Albans and they want a two-rack finish. 
You've got the builder over here who's building a house in, in, uh, in, in St Albans and wants to do the finish that is suitable for St Albans. So there is no waiting queue, sort of normal queue or... Yeah, you never know. Pardon? I mean, there is no queue and there is no words to wait. But there is no skipping at all no, there's to no be cats unless you go court. Correct, correct. You, you, you need that eligibility uh, number provided for, by the DBDRV first. And no point to go to the office. No if point it at exists. all. No. Exist. You should have a, uh, a claim manager um, and they should be able to uh, hopefully expedite the process a little bit for you. Yeah, but emails are, yeah, just... Have Do you spoke? Have documentation you sp and uh, emails are all there. Yep. But no, just no response after a certain point. Yeah, look, that's that's unusual from my experience. Yeah, from the DBDRV. Yeah, unconditional yeah. offer. Pardon? Uh, it's unconditional offer, but with all the you know docu documentation, yeah, sent to them, but yeah. no response. Yeah, okay, that's... No uh, and and you, you, you've, got a, you've got a claim number and everything with them? Yeah, yeah, everything, yes. Mm, that's very strange. I'd, I'd probably give them a call. There is no, no, no number you can't call. It says on the web. There is no way to communicate. I'll be able to get you a number. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. All right, uh, another question over here, please. Hi, Brandon. Hi. Yeah, actually, I have a question a little bit uh, different. Uh, uh, I got my first PPR, uh, first place of my residence in 2020. So uh, last year, uh, I believe in uh, July or September, so due to the earthquake, uh, we got a crack on our uh, pen slab. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we uh, lost claim to RACV. Yep. So, but they rejected a couple of weeks ago and now they are saying like, uh, it's not our fault, it's a builder fault. Mm. So we can uh, like uh, uh, ask to builder or we can like uh, put complaint against the builder because the builder is saying, uh, no, that's not my fault and that's not, that's not our work to manage it. Yep. May I ask how old the home is? Yeah, two years. Two years. Okay, so you're in that grey period. So uh, if it happened within the two-year period, the builder has a lot more responsibility. After the two years, they're only uh, liable for structural issues. So that might be how the uh, builder's trying to uh, weasel his way out of that. Um, in saying that, that's, so the first, that, that, that's, that's the first instance I've heard RACV so knocking the, out. Earth, the, earth, crack, earth the, the crack came uh, after 12 months of the completion. But, uh, like I bought in 2020, it was brand new. Yep. Yeah, and I think after 12 or 13 months, yeah, that crack came on the bench. Has the crack occurred along a join line? Uh, just next to the sink. Okay. In the, in the corner. So you've got like a little edge there between the sink and the front of the bench top. Has, it's occurred there, has it? Oh, uh, now it's moving. It, it, now it's moving on all the bench here. Yeah, okay. And it sounds to me like the uh, bench top wasn't installed correctly without any uh, substrate material underneath it. So stone's quite, a, it's actually quite a weak material when it's laid horizontally. Um, it should have a, 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 a substrate material beneath it to provide the, the support. Um, it sounds to me like that hasn't been provided. So that would be something that the builder is responsible for. In that in instance, I would refer that back to the DBDRV. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more question, just over here, please. Okay, two questions. All right. Hi. Good day, James. Mm. Really good question. So when the, the new builder took over the project, we, we, we found out that builder number one and this building surveyor have a very close working relationship. Um, we, I'll go back one step actually, because this is something else that you should be familiar of. Um, when building a home, if you're, uh, if you're doing a two-part contract and there's a build contract uh, and a land contract, uh, if you're building from scratch, picking your specifications out and everything else, you actually have the option of choosing your own surveyor. 
The builder can nominate someone they recommend. However, you must direct them to act in your, your interest. Um, going back to your question, though, uh, so it was found that they, were, they had a close working relationship. The building surveyor was very apprehensive about another builder coming onto the project. We never understood why. Um, we think we've discovered why now at this later stage. Nothing to date has occurred to that building surveyor. There's been no reprimand at all. Uh, it was, there was a, a complaint lodged to the Victorian Building Authority against that building practitioner being the, the, the surveyor. They came back saying there's insufficient evidence that, that, the, that the building surveyor should have been aware of these, these, uh, these poor workmanship uh, issues. Yep. Yeah. Pardon? So last I heard, so we started this project in 2018. Uh, the project was finished in late 2020. The last I heard at the start of this year, nothing had come of the builder and there was still a 250, it was about a $300,000 claim against that builder pending. Yep. Yep. There, I know of three other projects in the, in the same sort of area between Hawthorne and Templestowe that are still underlay. I'm not going to mention any names. So, um, but just just, just take, take into consideration the price points. So if you've got one builder that's saying $2 million to create something like this and you've got another builder that's saying $3 million, ask yourself the question, why is builder number one so much cheaper than builder number two? That's, that, that's my advice there because they were a good 25% cheaper than any other operator that quoted on the original, original development. All right. Uh, Sorry, mate, just quickly. Was the developer able to recover any of those costs back? Not to date, or yep. not to a couple of months ago. Yep. Yep. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right, last question over here, thanks. Run, Jack, run. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I really um, found it very useful. Can I just ask a clarification question? Do you offer this investor package in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria? Correct. Sunshine Coast? Yep. Fantastic. Thank yep. you. No worries at all. All right. Um, put your hands together and thank Brendan for his thank you. information. Hey, guys. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that video. It was amazing. A lot of detail. Unbelievable case studies. Now, if you've enjoyed that content, and if you want to learn more, then definitely I encourage you to invest in the Property Portfolio Accelerator, Accelerator online video course. This course consists of a recording that has been professionally edited, and we've got a manual. So it's basically 30 hours of content and a manual that you can follow at your own leisure from, from the uh, comfort of your own home and watch it over a period of time. See, one of the challenging things of doing a boot camp over four days is that the, there's a lot of information that's thrown at you. And unfortunately, we have only so much information that you can retain over a 12 hour or 24 hour period of time. And most of the people that attend, if there's any negative feedback, it's just the, the content was so intense and there was so much of it, they're going to have to go back through their notes and videos to listen in and repeat that information so they can absorb most of it. So getting a 30-hour 30 30 uh, online video course um, gives you the advantage of watching it at your own pace. So you might have designated time per week of three or four hours and then you can smash that out in a month or so. Yes, I've seen people watch it in four or five days. I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend two or three hours per day with notes. That's the, way, the best way to absorb it, which is over a two-week period of time, you'll be able to watch the whole course. This course can literally change your life. <clears throat> this, is, this is not a sales pitch. This is reality. These guys are not salespeople. They're consultants at the highest level of their field. So these lawyers, accountants, financial planners, all they do all day long in, in Melbourne is help investors build up large property portfolios. The online video course is $997. It's a thousand bucks, guys, for 30 hours of, of edited content. It's probably, in terms of an hourly rate, just the lawyers will charge you 300 bucks an hour. So you're getting huge value in terms of information and content that's concise, ready to be applied in the current market environment. These are the experts that are covered. We've just heard from Brendan Frost from, from this Director of Landmark Inspections. If you enjoyed that information, definitely I don't even hesitate to recommend the course for you. 
Thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I'll see you on the inside.